All right, Peace, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh my God. Hi. I I can hear you. Yay. Let's do oh that. my God. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for of doing course. this interview. Uh you. yeah. You're like, I'm like such a huge I, I I know you probably don't like the word fan, but whatever like a respectable word of being a fan is, that's what I am. Wow. Uh, thank you. To you. Yeah. Um I'll say, well, first of all, I want to say um, I really appreciate that you, you know, made some time in your schedule. Um, and, you know, I want folks to go into the description because in the description I put, um, you know, your fundraising information. Oh, so yeah, I saw that. thank you for that. Yeah. If we could just start off rip and um, just talk about that. Let's just talk about that before we get into anything else. Let's just start right there. Okay. Oh, shoot. Sorry. No, it's all good. It's all good. We're live right now. Yeah, we're no. live. We're live. <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad you I'm glad you made the time. I'm glad that you um, you know, carved out a little bit of time. And you know, we could go as long as you know you feel comfortable going. I usually go to like 9 30. If you don't want to go that long, I'm cool with that too. So yeah, I'm good. Thank you. And thank you also for the give me that money i appreciate that for sure oh yeah no i didn't even say nothing about that <laughs> <laughs> thank you but, <laughs> yeah but yeah so i just i wanted um people to know like you know that you're raising money and i wanted you to like you know talk about that a little bit so we just you know throughout the program just remind people you know what i'm saying to eat to give and to share that thank you yeah yeah so um can you talk about that a little bit Oh yeah, I thought. Um, where would you want me to start? There, or are you doing an intro? Yeah, or yeah. No, no. Before the intro, that's before oh, intro. Let's. No, that's, that's our right. intro. <laughs> let's start the, we could put that to later. Okay, okay, okay. I thought it, I think it's super important, so that's why I want to put no, it. No, we will, we will. Just like I rather do the intro and stuff. We'll get into it for sure. Okay, cool. So, um, I started this new podcast. Um, I've been wanting to do a women in hip hop podcast for a long time. I have another podcast and um, talked to Kalanji and um, he was like, oh, present something. So I sent a presentation and um, the group, you know, looked at it. They were like, cool. And just full transparency, the whole podcast, I was thinking about you. Like, I just been thinking about your work. I've been thinking about your body of work, like all the things that you've been doing. I've been following you for a while. I just appreciate all that you've brought to the space. I've been learning so much from you. And um, I, I, I don't know how many people tell you thank you all the time, but I just can't thank you enough because as like, you know, I've, I've watched you over the years, like fight for us, you know, in times when it wasn't popular in times when you took a lot of hits. And I just want you to know that you're seen. And you're appreciated, and I just I love you so much. But um, that's my intro. But uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, but I definitely want to thank you so much. I'm going through like this moment where I'm trying to figure out my next step, and still bitter about certain things, but also like happy about certain things. So yeah, that was a beautiful introduction. So thank you. Yeah. So you've been, you know, in in, in my understanding and the way I've seen you, you've been a journalist. You've been, I'm going to say, um, an ass kicker. <laughs> you know, you've been oh relentless. Yes. <laughs> you've been relentless in this messaging um, around, you know, our power. Like us, you know, voicing our power, but us standing in our power. But you've stood up for us. You stood up with us. And um, as a woman in hip hop, I just watched all the ways in which you've, you know, pushed us to the forefront. And so, um, you know, for me, you know, I, I just, I just think you're like the quintessential, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop. Like to me, you are hip hop. That's what hip hop is. Unapologetic. Oh you. you know what I'm saying? I mean, just unapologetic. You know what I'm saying? It's like amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's people in the chat saying peace and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, Do we see the chat? Um, say so, yeah, so if you go into the stream yard thing and do you see the thing that says like comments and then no, there's one that says no, like I know I don't stars. even see it. Oh, maybe because I full screened us. Probably. 
Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, there's a lot of people already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they love you. They love and we then love I'm you. Live on Instagram because I just got a lot of followers over my uh, speech at Encore in New Orleans, where I kind of talked about my dissertation around um, Black Latinx identity in the United States and the politics of hip hop and all that. But yo, there's mad people here. Okay, let's go. <laughs> let's go. So yeah, so you know, um, you've 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 talked so much. Like I, I I could go on and on and on about your bio, but I wanted you to give your introduction because I saw you, um, on um Dr. Ball's show, and mm. you gave such a wonderful uh, the the most recent time, and yeah. you gave such a wonderful intro like self introduction. So I don't want to put like my intro on you. I would like if you could like tell people who you are as in your words. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm starting to use my middle name more than ever. My my full name is as actually Rosa Alicia Clemente. Um it was I was named after my both my grandmothers, but look, I consider myself an organizer, scholar, activist, a people's journalist people's journalists, um, because I wasn't trained in journalism and what that looks like. And I'm not objective in anything when I cover things, you know, I'm covering things that, that relate to black freedom. And I'm a hip hop head born April 18th, 1972 in the Bronx, you know? Um, so as hip hop celebrates 50, I celebrated my 50th birthday last year, you know, and I, I was, as many of us were, you know, at that time where we saw the Bronx burning uh, New York City, super uh, um, poverty, you know, and I, I would have never thought, I, I mean, the word hip hop activist, obviously, it's like something where you're like, when did that happen? But I know what it meant to me because my cousins would take me to the Bronx to roller skating jams and they would take me to the, the jams and the parties. And it's crazy to this day, I tell everybody, two of my cousins live in the building 1520 Sedgwick, you know, so it's actually also like family kind of thing. But yeah, and a scholar activist, you know, I'm, I'm trying to complete my dissertation and I'm trying to get back in the classroom and really mentor more than um, before. So yeah, that's who I am. And I oh. currently live in Albany, New York, which is, you know, because so many people around the country think that New York City is New York State and it's not. Um, I live in the capital of, and um, the amount of uh, poverty and violence here all the way to Buffalo, it, 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 it's a lot, you know? So in actuality, us here in Albany are trying to do something about this in the future. But yeah, I live in Albany, New York, which is the capital of uh, New York State, three hours outside of New York City. And I think, I think probably why I feel so connected to you, we're the same age. You know, and I grew up between New York and, and Detroit, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I grew up in Manhattan. You know, I guess they call it the Upper West Side in, in this moment. But yeah, yeah, it was. We didn't have that back in the day. It was like 84th between Amsterdam and Broadway, right by Brandeis High School. But um, I just, you know, have watched you. You know, I remember the summits. I remember when, you know, back when like activism was like this kind of like weird thing in hip hop and people were like, what are y'all doing? Um, I went to Howard University, you know, with April and all and all them guys and they, they're they kind of like my mentors. And so April, with the hip hop summit. Yeah. yeah. April Silver, Ra Rasmus. Yeah, April Silver. Yeah, Rasmus Rocka. Yeah. Yeah, all of them. And so, like, for me, I'm, you know, I remember when hip hop activism was like an anomaly. You know what I mean? Like, we, it was like yeah. it was done, but it was seen like, what, what is that? And that so, can sense. you, can you talk about like helping? I, I, I mean, is it okay if I kind of credit you with maybe helping birth that whole thing? Or is no, I mean, like I, that, I, no, okay. no, the term hip hop activist um, came about in the 90s, and it's actually Harry Allen who was the media assassin for public enemy. And what that means uh, for folks that don't know is that, I mean, you know, Chuck D is my comrade, a close friend, like, you know, this 50th year, we've been going back and forth talking about like the next level. So sometimes I'm like, I'm talking to Chuck D, this is insane. Like, when did I ever think this would happen? You know, I, I was in high school looking at rap pages and yo MTV and like Chuck, you know, but, um. 
No, so Harry Allen coined that term. And then I, I, I think what happened is that in the early 1990s and into the late 90s to the early 2000s, we would not yet feel the effects of um, what Bill Clinton would do, which is when Bill Clinton was president, he signed the Juvenile Justice Act, which um, really vamped on 13 to 21 year olds, mostly African American, um, Latino young men. So no, Harry Allen coined that term. And I don't remember when it got back into the zeitgeist, but I do know that Harry Allen coined it, but Universal Zulu Nation had already created the five elements, right? So I tell people, these are the five elements. I'm not an MC. I don't move the crowd in that way. I'm not a DJ. I'm not a breaker. I'm not a graph artist. I reside in the fifth element of hip hop, knowledge, culture, and politics, which was always there. I think what happened in the 90s is my generation began to be like, obviously hip hop, was a political space already of how it was created. How do we use the culture to uplift a lot of the issues that weren't being talked about, particularly political prisoners and prisoners of war? So we begin to see the term used a lot in the 90s, but by the early 2000s, it's like part of the zeitgeist, right? This where the hip hop political convention came from and so many other things, including people who were running for office calling themselves, you know, the hip hop mayor, the hip hop assembly man, you know, so you begin to see that fifth element be in line with the other elements. And I think that's where like I connect with you. Cause I feel like that's like my element, <laughs> you know, as well. And I feel like when I've, when I've experienced you speak or teach, you know, you really have taught us how to, I'm going to say like live in the intersections you know, with the, and I, I guess like for me, it's like, and maybe for you too, I don't know, but it's like when you live in an intersection, you kind of sort of, you live it so much. And it is sometimes when people just make you aware of all of your identities, but you've always like visibilized like all of your identities. And I, I want to, um, if you could speak to us more about like, you know, how, how you were able to like even understand that about yourself. Yeah, you know, that word intersection, again, we don't really see that until the you know, early 2000s with Kimberly Crenshaw's article where she created the term and talked about it through a legal lens. But um, see, I lost my train of thought. Ask the question again. <laughs> well, I guess it's just like, you know, now it's very normalized to talk about like intersectionality and, and people are very aware of like all these identities. But I, for yeah. me... You are, I want to say, a kind of a pioneer of like speaking in this kind of way about, you know, just visibilizing all of your identities and that, and that, you know, you're not just one or this or that. And, you know, just how you've been moving through, I guess, what I'm going to say the intersections of self. Yeah. I mean, look, I grew up, um, I spent uh, seven years growing up in the Bronx, and then my parents moved us to Westchester County, which is, the second richest suburb in America. So it was like crazy, right? Like, cause every weekend my mom and dad, my dad to this day owns his business in the Bronx. My mom would take us to see our cousins, right? And then I would go into this like super suburban manicured lawn and well and beautiful house and kind of thing. So all I knew until I went to college was that I was Puerto Rican. I was a Boricua. You know, um, I was raised that way. My parents were very purposeful in making sure we all had time with both sets of our grandparents, that we would go to Puerto Rico. I didn't start speaking English until my parents moved to the suburbs where I was forced to speak English. Um, but I think me understanding all these identities came when I was a student at the State University of New York in Albany, New York. And for the first time, year and a half, I was lost. You know, I, I, I like being away from, from home, but I was just like, what am I supposed to be doing? All I knew was that I wanted to be a teacher, hands down. That's all I knew. But by the end of my second year at, 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 at SUNY Albany, I joined um, two organizations, Fuerza Latina, which was the Latino like umbrella group. And these terms, folks might be like, why are you using these terms? This was 1990, okay? <laughs> like I went to school in 1990, I graduated in 95. So even some of the terminology is 
dated or not used. But um, I went to both. So I went to Fuerza Latina and then I went to Suba, the Albany State University Black Alliance. So when I went to the Fuerza Latina meeting, it was all conducted in Spanish. And I said something. I was like, why are y'all doing this? And they're like, our heritage. And I'm like, yeah, but a lot of us, a lot of Latino fo or Hispanic, that was the term, a lot of these Hispanic people, like, they don't know that. So you can't just assume that we all speak Spanish. And I got this real weird thing and I just felt uncomfortable. And then a week later, I went to Albany State University Black Alliance. We used to have these things called mass meetings where five to 700 students would show up. Basically all the African-American Latino students at that time, Asian and, and other folks of color. Um, and I went to the brother at that time that was the interim president. His name is Derek Westbrook. And I was like, I love this. I feel so like, I feel love. And I was like, but I'm not black. And he's like, well, let's talk about that. And, <laughs> right, and he, I was like, I'm not of African descent. And he's like, let's talk about that. And basically him and a couple other brothers and sisters just schooled me, right? At the same time, I'm going back home all of a sudden. I'm like, I'm black. And my dad's like, what? My mom's like, what? And I'm like, but I, in fact, let me, I was saying I was African descent because I really didn't start calling myself black in that way till 2001. But that experience then led me to run, to be the president of Suba. I run and I, I ran and I won. And a couple of days after I had all the Latino the organizations hating on me. And I had some um, African-American people that were like, she's Puerto Rican, she's not black. Why is she running the Albany State University Black Alliance? But by then I was getting like my little, you know, tidbits and I was like, listen, like, you know what we'll do? We're just gonna say we have black and Hispanic man's week, black and Hispanic. So, when I became president, I was very purposeful in that because I wasn't using the term black yet for myself, you know? Um, and really like one day I had a high level Latino administrator call me into his office. I'm like, oh, he, you know, he's calling me in because all the organizations have now voted for next year, the budget, the president, he's going to like give me some gems. And he was like, you need to pick a side. And I was like, what? And he's like, are you black or are you Puerto Rican? And literally I was like, fuck you, I'm both. And I bounced and I told his director, like, this is crazy that you have someone working in the staff who would even bring me in and say that to me. And at that time, also the big eight fraternity and sororities really loom large in the best way, you know? So I never pledged, but it was really the fraternity and, and the big eight fraternity and sororities, you know, that like Alpha Kappa, I'm, I'm sorry, Alpha Phi Alpha, all of them were like, we got you, we got your back. And it was, a, that was the year where I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Like, and in me doing this, I was also going home, you know, so I would tell my little brother and my sister, like, you know, you black, right? Or I would tell my sister who's darker than me. And I would be like, Dad, you know you black? He's like, yo no sabe, yo soy boricua. And I'm like, <laughs> but you know you're black. And he tells me this story basically about when he left Puerto Rico to migrate here. He was um, driving a cab in Brooklyn. He got pulled over. The cops started using the N-word. And he was like, no, yo soy no eso, yo soy boricua. And they were like, we don't care what kind of N you are kind of thing. And in having that discussion with my dad, I was realizing that he never told that story. So me coming home really like bonded and, and fixed me and my dad's relationship because he was so open. And I would be like, do you know that one third of the island in Puerto Rico, the women were sterilized? He's like, no, I didn't know here. I'd be like, do you know Pedro Abisu Campos and the Independence Party? And he'd go, Rosie, we don't really talk about that. People were scared. I'd give him another book. And he would read them. So like, we're vibing. My mom's more like, do what you got to do. And I knew that at least with my sister and brother. Um, and if it wasn't for that being there, but also um, my professor, Dr. Vivian Verdell Gordon, I took, 
I got mistakenly put into a class for seniors, a 400 level class called Black Family in America. And I was like, how did I get in this class? And then I, I went. And that first day I was like, I want to be a black studies major. And uh, at SUNY Albany, our, our department is called Africana Studies. And I went up to Dr. Gordon and I was like, I want to be in black studies. And she goes, here you go, change your major. And that moment was the moment that I was like, that's who I am. And then the other crystallizing moment was in 1992, where the um, rebellion in Los Angeles with their police officers that killed Rodney King were let go. And we were watching it on TV. And I had just been elected president of Asuba, but still the brother Derek was interim. And we got called to the campus from the president at that time, um, Patrick Swaggart, who, who was black. So we're like, oh, you know, he's got us. No, he what he wanted to tell us was like, we don't need any rebellion. We need to make sure that US student leaders make the white students on this campus feel nice. And I was like, what the fuck? And I'm look, I'm and I was like, but President Swagger, you're black. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, right? And I was just like, oh, but that night. And in the ensuing days, we also connected to the community in our Albany. So we weren't just on our campus isolating. So those were the moments for me that I was like, all right, you know, and obviously being in black studies to this day, I'm in black studies. I tell everybody who asks me, Latino studies hates me. Chicano studies hate me. They never wanted me. It's fine. But I am within the, as Dr. James Turner, um, who literally passed away a year ago today, um, he was like, you're also a scholar activist. Your job is to use your scholarship for the people. So from that experience at SUNY Albany, two years later, I got recruited to Cornell University, which is the first black studies department that had, um, an institution in the country at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. And Dr. Turner recruited me and he said, don't think you're coming here to get a Cornell degree. You're coming here. Specifically, he told me, he said, you need to study the Young Lords and you need to study the COINTELPRO movement. And that was it. Like by the time I left Cornell in 98, I was like, let's go. I'm, I'm ready, you know? You know, now I understand. Thank you for sharing that. And now I understand this connection, right? Because growing up in New York City, like I grew up in like, I guess it's like a kind of mixed neighborhood in Manhattan. And so the school I went to was like in Columbus, right? Like 72nd Columbus. Yeah. So you had like everybody going to that school, but the black kids from Harlem were sent to that school to like, you know, get a better education. But majority of the uh, kids that went there was Boricua. And then it was like some of the Jewish kids was coming from, you know, uh, kind of that sort of vortex right there. And I was friends with like kind of everybody. And I remember, you know, being in, in intermediate school and just not understanding because there was so much, uh, I guess, division at that point, even though we were all went to, you know, we went to school yeah. together, we was all doing hip hop, but in the early, you know, like early mid eighties, I just remember I had a lot of Puerto Rican friends and, because that's where I live. So these are my friends. I'm spending like their house, vice versa. We know the parents, you know, I, I grew up actually in a Puerto Rican home as a, a child. And yeah. so I spoke the language and cooked the food. So I very highly identified, but I knew I was black. I never thought I wasn't, but I just culturally identified a lot. So the, and I wasn't from Harlem. So the black kids from Harlem would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. Hey, what the fuck are Puerto Ricans? And, and I was cool with the Dominican kids because I, you know, understood Spanish. And they would segregate the Dominicans back then. They'd be on the second floor. It was called bilingual. So yeah. we would go up to second floor, get them, and we'd go to lunch, go to recess, and everybody be kicking it in recess. And it was this, like, animosity you know, like between between everybody. And it, it wasn't until I feel like, you know, when when I kind of heard you speak in some of the, in the you know, in some of the earlier days that I was like, oh, snap, like 
this is kind of putting all this together for me. Like, yeah. and, and I was raised in a, you know, my, my family is from the Black Power Movement. Um, one of my uncles is one of the uh, co-founders with um, General Baker, a legal revolutionary Black worker. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in that. And like for me in the 70s, you know, um, Boricuas were very, in my, in my world, Boricuas were very conscious. So yeah. you put you put a lot of things together for me because I remember in in my circles there was certain worlds where we were in and we were all like cool and we were culturally like similar but then there'd be other worlds that I'd be in and people would just didn't understand and it wasn't until I started really like listening to you where you kind of helped me to kind of see you know what I mean like make those connections but also the importance of of understanding the specific histories of our people and, yeah. and honor honoring our histories. So I just want to thank you for helping, you know, to, to, with my personal education, to learn more about, you know, um, even using the word Boricua, right. Or like, yeah. why, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I learned that from you, mm. you know what I'm saying? And yeah. like, or, or like Afro, Afro Latino, you know, like identity, or even I heard you talk about, and I wanted to get you to talk about this here. I heard you talk about, you know, the like, okay, do we use um, Latinx? Why we, why we should, why we shouldn't, or why we do, why we don't, why, we, you know? So I, w I want to know if you could like even speak on that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't like, I, I don't refer to myself as Latinx, Latino, Latina, Lat Latinx. Like, look, at the end of the day, white supremacy, um, one of the first tenets of it is to divide and conquer, right? So like, um, and language is very powerful. So, I don't call myself that, although I use the term because especially right now, there's this trend around Latinx, right? Like, you know, and I understand the non-gendering of the language because in Spanish, everything is gendered and the X represents non-binary, right? I get it. But it, it very quickly, it, it had been already hijacked. I think it was like actually kind of purposeful in using these terms, right? So for me, these terms are apolitical. They do not refer to movement. They don't refer to a homeland, a nation, or anything. Now, the word Boricua specifically comes from the original name of our island is Borinquen, which is given to us by the Taino indigenous population. What people don't know is that when we were beginning, when the United States invaded us, the the reason we became Puerto Rico is because they were wanting to go to rich ports because that's what that means. Puerto like right, but the word Boricua is it's like when we say that term, it's it, it connects you. It's it's kind it's almost no, it is exactly like this. When fraternities and sorority people get together and they have their enclaves, their all of that, right? they have that secret handshake. That's what Boricua is. You say it to another Puerto Rico, and it means something, right? So it's like Borinquen is the original name. We're colonized in support of riches, i.e. Puerto Rico. But to this day, you're not going to find any Boricuas for the most part, Puerto Ricanos that don't understand that term, right? And it means something between us. And thank you for breaking that down. And then another thing I wanted to uh, ask you. So there's this whole, it's kind of old now, but I see it a lot. This whole argument about like, you know, the Fat Joe thing, like, the, <laughs> like you know, um, uh, do, you know, what is the origin? I think it's Busta Rhymes, right? Like it, 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 in the origin of hip hop, you know, were uh, Caribbean people, were you know, uh, Boricua people, you know, originators. For me, I'm gonna say yes, you know, uh, you know, and so I wanted, if you could speak about that as well. Yeah, so first, you know, look, what what Big Pun and Fat, especially Big Pun and, and Fat Joe, but what Big Pun did when he, when you listen to this album, Capital Punishment, and you, you know, you hear a hundred percent, he is a Boricua, born and raised in New York City next to other black people, 
right? So the relationship, particularly with African-American Jamaicans and Puerto Ricans, and then Dominicans was tight politically, you know, but the African-American experience and the Puerto Rican experience are so similar because we're U.S. citizens, but we're always denied our citizenship and what that means. So when Big Pun drops that, it is literally the first time you ever heard in a song, Boricua Morena, right? So people will be like, oh, Morena is anti-Black. I'm like, no, everything's about how you say it, right? Like there's a difference between Boricua Morena and Ese Boricua Morena. Like, you know, this, that, you know, is like anti-Black, but, you know, and to this day, when that song plays, it's like, yes, you know? But what is being lost in this 50 years a celebration of hip hop is who started the culture. And it was Jamaicans, African-Americans, and Puerto Ricans. That's it. It's not to say nobody else belongs, but that's the actual history because that was the population in the Bronx. So when Buster Rhymes, I think two weeks ago, when he did his uh, was doing a show, and he said, "Yo, let me sell you right now," there would like hip hop is, both um, African American, black people. He said, and Puerto Ricans, right? Like when you see some of the older, you know, hip hop heads like KR Swan and them, they grew around Boricuas. You know, we were all living in the Bronx at that time. I mean, you know, it's fascinating to me who. <laughs> who turned who has turned out uh or become incredible people from the bronx tarana burke <laughs> mark anthony neal joan morgan and me we kind of occupied that same time period um so you know that was important now like i've never had any issue with fat joe for me fat joe is clearly the bridge that he as a hip hop artist is not shedding who he is, but he's always giving homage to the other creators of the culture. You know, so when when people are like, oh, Fat Joe is, you know, he, he made an anti-black statement. I'm like, no, he didn't. Like he was talking about his experience. It's Fat Joe. If anybody knows that brother, I don't know him like that, but if anybody watches or knows, he is that Boricua that is so tied to blackness and particularly black people in hip hop. And he always gives homage to that. And he understands the politics of it, you know? Um, so what they both did was also make sure that Boricuas were also centered when we talk about the foundation of hip hop and how it began. Yeah, and so, and thanks for that. And I'm glad you articulated that in that way because <laughs> I didn't have as articulate a way to say that. Yeah. And so, um, and then let's talk about the women because there's there's many Boricua women that have been a part of, you know, the culture as well. And I wanted to know if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, look, um, for me, Raquel Rivera and um, she's she wrote when um, Puerto Ricans from the hip hop zone, where she her whole book was about what he was in, in, in hip hop as co-founders, as creators, and part part of that. But the other, you know, Latina women in the culture, I mean, like Martha Diaz, number one. Like I tell Martha Diaz every day, you're the last woman standing in hip hop, girl, in, in terms of the politics of it. And, and the museums, the archiving, the pioneers and all of that, you know, um, and I, I would say that she's the most important person around that, where she, like, again, the last woman standing, she has a goal and she's meeting that goal around archiving, preservation, and making sure that the, the culture is celebrated and that activists and organizers are, are, are part of that, you know, so um, to fly. The, I, I would say, I mean, Lady Pink is amazing too. Two Fly, Ecuadorian, you know, I would name her the number one graph artist, honestly. And all her work is like, you can't see that lady or the loved one, but that's her work I've been collecting. I you love know. her. She made a, uh, she made my, one of my logos. I know. My, yes. Yeah. All my logos. Dope. I mean, and Rockefeller. Come yes. 
the illest B-girl of all time who's out there still kicking it and doing the work. La Bruja, Puerto Riqueña, Taina. Um, people would just say she's a spoken word artist. I'm like, she's an artist, period. You know, um, uh, Raquel Cepeda, one of the first, probably the first Latina journalist I saw in uh, writing about hip hop, you know, in um, in the Village Voice. Mimi Valdez, Afro-Cuban, editor of Vibe. You know, um, so these are the women, you know, that would be quote considered Latina women. You know, I, I don't, I don't racialize them because I don't know if they do that for, and that's for them to decide. But these are the women I've been around. You know, um, and then, uh, you know, as, as Latina women, they, they have been the most impactful to me, for sure. Yeah. And it's so interesting because for me, too, I feel like they are culture shapers. Yeah. I feel like they've, they've shaped a, a lot of my thinking, a lot of my sensibilities, for sure. Um, and I, I remember uh, Raquel Cepeda, she made that film um about blood diamonds. diamonds yeah that Which, film was powerful that film is powerful and a lot of people haven't seen it but she took they go yes you know and and uh, in all the bad bunny and daddy yankee and all that people have tried to erase they go Calderon, who is to me the number one reggaeton artist you know there's a reason he also left the industry to do other stuff in puerto rico but the blood diamonds we have been talking about it Raquel made a documentary about it and she took them to the continent to be like, so this is what you're promoting, you know? Yeah. I, and that, that movie is so, I work with youth and um, that's one of the films I always show you. Yeah. So and, powerful. Um, it's interesting how things land on younger people, like the difference, the way they interpret stuff. And um, when they get to the part of that documentary, there's, there's, um, where they go to an amputee village. Yeah. And uh, Raekwon doesn't want to get off the vehicle. Oh, yes. Right. And the, uh, the guy, yeah. I guess their guide or whoever, you know, he's like, come on, Ray. These are your people. You know, you're not going to say nothing to your people. And in the beginning of the documentary, Ray took everybody to his neighborhood. And one of the things he said on the tour, we know as they showed the neighborhood, like nobody don't want to look at the reality. Nobody don't want to look at this. They don't want to see us. And the, 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 the guy is like, come on, Ray, you know, this is the reality, you know, like you don't want to see it. And he's just like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And the kids are like, when I do the debrief at the end, I had a group of kids and I was like, so what did y'all think about? They was like, that nigga Raekwon is a bitch. I was like, oh. <laughs> I know. And then I'm like, it's, he's part of Wu-Tang Clan. How is this possible? But you know, when you see it, it's because he's confronted with it. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure he had to sit with that for a while. You yeah. know what I mean? And oh, yeah. process that for, yeah. for a while. It's not an excuse, but, you know, what Raquel did in that that documentary was showing also the internationalism of the culture. That those some of those young kids knew Wu Tang Clan, and they wanted Raekwon. You know what I'm saying? That in like that speaks to so much of it. You know, and um, I think it's probably been over 15 years. You know, it might even be 20. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. So for folks who listen in Blood Diamonds or uh, go to Raquel Cepeda's um, Instagram page, because Raquel Cepeda alone, the work she has done in the culture around documentaries, film and her, and and working with young women um, has been incredible. Yeah. Um, is 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 a uh, Nuala Cabral um, Latina? Nuala is uh, from Philly. Is she? You know, I've never asked Nuala actually. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, and uh, Anita Tihu from Chile. No, she would. Uh, yeah, no. She she would never say that. You know, yeah. and she would she would categorize herself as, as a Chilean. Okay, sure. gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and yeah. thanks for that distinction. And these are yeah. conversations I think are important to have. I know yeah. sometimes people get scared and uncomfortable, but I feel like the more and more we learn. You know what I'm saying? Then we can show respect to one another a little yeah. better. <laughs> so thank you for that. Okay, so um, I wanted to kind of jump into um, the work that you're doing right now, you know, to like, you know, um, I know, so I want to say, first of all, 
I really appreciate that conversation you had with Dr. Ball about, you know, running for president. You know mm -hmm. what? Let's talk about that for like a second. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you, I mean, you had, I'm going to say the balls, you know what I'm saying? To like be like, yo, I, I, we, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this right here at this time. And I think for me, it was the timing that I think was very, like, you know what I'm saying? Like the audacity of the timing, but just in, you know, in, in and of itself. But for me, I, but I, you know, fully bought in, you know what I'm saying? Because my thing was like, yeah, it's time. And I had watched you, you know what I'm saying? Give us all the political education all those years. I had watched you fight for us all those years. So for me, it was like a no brainer, like this makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, but I wanted to know if you could like, you know, just I, I, I probably talking about something maybe some people know, maybe don't. But yeah. I want to know if we could get into that a little bit. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, you know, me and Cynthia ran in 2008 on the Green Party ticket. A lot more people know than before. But I, you know, first and foremost, um, Jared was already running or, you know, and, and they were they had done a couple panels with him, Cynthia and a couple other people. When Cynthia got you know knew she would get the nomination she called me you know and then i called two people and jared was one of them and he was like i got you go do you you know I, it, it's interesting so what we're talking about for folks that don't know is that 15 years ago um this this past july i was nominated along with cynthia mckinney cynthia mckinney running as president and i was the vice presidential nominee and the way that even happened was cynthia was a congresswoman what well, had actually been voted out the democratic and the congressional black caucus spent money to get her out of congress and they did that um which is disgusting to this day right like the congressional black caucus kicks out the most progressive black congresswoman ever um but she had had a hearing on on political prisoners but then she also had a hearing around the FBI involvement in Tupac's life. So I would go to the hearing or this big event in September that happens when all the Congressional Black Caucus, all the bourgeois, you know, capitalists, electropolitic, all the Black Congress people and all that. And um, I met her and I was like, oh shit, she's, she's incredible. Um, and also what ha happened in 2001 is after the um, uh, World Trade Center bombing and the rush to war, she was the only Congresswoman to get Donald Rumsfeld to sit down and she broke him, I think. And I literally was like, that's probably the time where the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus was like, she can't be in office anymore. With that being said, she called me and I was like, okay. <laughs> And literally, I did say okay because I was also really broke. <laughs> and me, and my husband, and my daughter were living at my sister's house in, in South Carolina. And it was one of those moments where I had a really good job. I, I said what I had to say. I got fired. And I was like, what the hell? You know, and I, I, I get there and I get this call. And I was just like, fuck it, let's go. And um, 10 days later, I was in Chicago with Cynthia and she and I were nominated as president and vice president um, on the Green Party ticket. After that, we didn't really see each other too much because look, if you guys are saying the Green Party is not a, even on the ballot, which uh, no third party really is except for the libertarians and the working class party, but I don't consider the working class party independent at all. They're just another arm of the Democratic Party. But um, what people don't understand about third parties is that you have to fight to get on the ballot. And the goal is always to get 5% of the entire electorate, right? So when me and Cynthia call, uh, you know, talk, first we would tell people, like, we're not going to win. We're not even on 25 ballots. But what we want to do is create the space for those that are not getting caught up in the Obama hypnosis and all the glitterati of all of that. You know, and um, the Green Party have ran candidates before and have always been blamed, you know, and I was just like coming out of the National Hip Hop Political Convention. I was like, I don't need to create an agenda. It's literally here. We already created it. I'm taking it to the next level. So I took the ex exact National Hip Hop Political Convention agenda, and that was my platform as vice president. But I also included in that 
the um you know uh decolonizing puerto rico and the call for reparations for puerto ricans you know and um you know we we were in separate spaces but i traveled all over and um it took me a long time to get over um, how angry I was and, and definitely bitter um, towards so many people who were my so-called comrades. Um, you know, and today it's, it's incredibly, you know, I don't feel the need to um, have to be in the conversation, but I do notice all the time when anything is talked about, especially as independent politics. Um, me and Cynthia were just shitted on, including by African-American and Latino men. And, and you know, you know, I was telling somebody, I said, the way Dr. West is being treated is literally the opposite of how Cynthia was treated. Um, you know, the way, the love that he or Ralph Nader get, gets to this day we didn't experience any of that. You know, we experienced, my experience was every time I would wake up every day to have someone that was a comrade, someone I took, went jail for, for political, saying, this is the worst thing you're ever going to do. I had mentors being like, if you do this, you're going to be unhirable. If you do this, it's a betrayal of like, even someone was like, we traveling Malcolm. I was like, Malcolm X would never vote. Like it, it was also organizations that were revolutionary organizations. I'm like, y'all never voted ever. Like you never pushed an electoral politics. But when me and Cynthia decide to run is when y'all all get money to run. Ob I was like, this is batshit crazy. And you know, there's people to this day that called me in those weeks that I, I won't ever talk to, you know, because it's like, if we live in a democracy, why do we only have two parties? Can we just start with that? Because if you go around the world, except in the most dictatorship, um, order, the, order, uh, governments, I'm sorry, like there's mad people who run. There's a lot of parties. Like the Socialist Party was a party on the ballot in the United States until the late 60s. You know, so I'm like, so now all of a sudden you want to support Obama, but you don't want to support Cynthia. And a lot of it's because we're women, right? Because I always said this. I always said, if it was like Immortal Technique and uh, I don't know, and one of Dead Press, oh, they would have got mad love. Everybody would like, fuck that, yeah, against the system, F Obama and the campaign. We didn't get that, you know, and we got a lot of death threats. And thank God for the FOI, the Fruit of Islam, because it was the FOI and the Nation of Islam who hit us up like Yanni Protection. We were like, absolutely. Oh, and again, this was in 2008. The Facebook was just starting. I knew that I had got an opportunity to bring forth the idea of like the political convention or, or hip hop political agenda, but also to let people know this two party system is corrupt, this duopoly is corrupt. And as long as you keep voting for Democrats, these things are gonna happen. Now, after the inauguration, I wrote an article called why um, President Obama is not the first hip hop president. Um, because when he was running as well, right? Like, like Puff Daddy, the vote, go, no, all like Jay-Z and all of them, Obama's the first black president. I say, yeah, he might be, but he's not the first hip hop president. And I go into what I think Obama's probably gonna do. And if people read that article, everything I said is what he did. And not because I'm a prophet, I study the system. Barack Obama is the, also the head of the Democratic Party, right? So like, he's the one that said at AFRICOM that is now, you know, if we look at the situation that's happening now in Niger and all of that, he began that. He's, his presidency deported the most people, you know, undocumented people, more than George Bush. He started the drone wars. You know, and and yeah, it, it took me a long time. And and basically what I had to do was just disappear for a moment after that. I was just like, I was hurt. I was upset. I was like, I don't understand like 
why people would like discourage me and hate on me, especially when it's like, you don't have to like that. Don't listen to me then. But what is all these phone calls and emails? I mean, there were times where I had a group of brothers that were calling me C-U-N-T. You know, I had, it, it was, it was crazy to this day. I, I'm still processing it for my memoir, but all that being said is what I did was bring the national hip hop political agenda that was created by over 3000 hip hop people. Um, and I ran with that and that was my platform. And, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm glad we did it, you know, and it also exposed me to, um, particularly like white poverty that I've never really seen until I was running. I knew it existed, but until I was running and going into like Kentucky, Virginia and all that, you're like, oh shit, this is poverty. This is working class. The whole system's corrupt capitalism, you know, like it was all coming together for me during that run. Thank you for running. First of all, I feel like <laughs> when you were running, I feel like we had hope. Let me be honest with you, because I felt like I felt like your running, like it made me. I had not for I had only voted because like I didn't want to, you know, shit on my ancestors. I'm yeah. honest with you, <laughs> like that was Please. the only reason I was showing up. But it wasn't until you like hopped in the race that I felt like, I don't know. I just felt like, yeah, we got a candidate. And so I just, I wonder like, you know, I, you know, I know we're, you know, we're moving into election cycle. We're always in some election cycle, whether it's the every two years or whatever, every four years, every two years, I'm wondering like, um, there's always this debate on the left around like the usefulness or not of the, you know, electoral space. I'm wondering like your thoughts on this side of running, like, I guess, and it's, and it's kind of like a loaded question, but it's like, um, my brain is going to like the intersections of like everything that's going on on the continent right now, mm. everything that's been happening across the diaspora, you know, things we don't even, you know, aren't even visibilized in this moment, you know, think, and, and, and what's happening in Cuba and like, you know what I'm saying? What's what's going on in Puerto Rico? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and and just the left. You know what I'm saying? It feels like it feels like we're very fractured. You know what I'm saying? It feels like um, I don't know. It just feels I I don't understand what's going on. So I'm just wondering, like for you as a person that gets to, you know, I don't know, see things from from the perspective that you see things. Like, what do you see? Well, first I see that for me, the electoral political project in this country is dead. It was never meant to be all people. And now it's not about most people, you know? So I, I think a huge mistake that the left has made, movements have made in general, is to now switch a lot of the work from organizing to electoral politics. You know, people are hoping to vote for someone who will save them. And that's never going to happen. And when I talk to young people, it's interesting because now when I go do events, I'll have students come up to me like, so my mom was getting her master's when you ran and we talked about it in eighth grade. And now I'm a freshman or like my mom, my mom and dad supported you. You know, they still have your buttons. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, that's dope. You know, so I know what it, it meant to people now, but, you know, we're now in a time where I don't think there's a left, honestly. And I, I, I don't, whatever we thought movements were, all I see now is groups getting a, some money and squandering everything. And, and also like, the failure of what's happening is why young people are so not down with what they call organizations. Right. You know, and so, and, and I see it from, from young people, they don't trust any institution, which I'm like, no, they're absolutely right. How do they become organizers and activists? So I think there's been too much emphasis on electoral politics, but also we're living in this 24 hour news cycle where it's like, all about that anyway, you know, and it's like, 
I don't understand how left or political movements to this day think that these elected officials are going to do the right thing. Perfect example, look at already what Karen Bass is doing in LA. She comes out of movements. She was a congresswoman. She runs, she gets the people's support, and now she's not doing anything that people wanted, especially on police violence, right? Or we can look at all mostly African-American, Latino, you know, people in office. We have the most African-American Latinos in office ever, and our material conditions are worse than ever. You know, so I think it's a what has happened is like people are a brand or they're visible. If you're not a brand and you're not visible, then you don't count. That's what it's come down to. If you can't monetize your brand, you don't count. And this idea that we think we can ever electorally get freedom is insanity. And the way I always tell young people is your our best leaders were never in office. Malcolm, Martin, Fanny, Ida, like Lolita, Albisu, go, we can go down the line. All our political prisoners that are free, you know, they've never ran for office. Look at the impact that they have made. You know, so I take it with a grain of salt. That being said, I'm a member of the Green Party. I vote Green. And if Dr. West gets the nomination, I will be there to support him. Um, because I think it's critically important that we have another voice. You know, and some people are already hating on Dr. West. And I'm like, well, what the fuck do you want us to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do y'all want? Because at this point, the biggest issue we are all facing is the catastrophe of climate. So that shit ain't going to get solved by voting for someone. That's going to get solved by people on the ground creating communities that can help themselves, but also be self-determining in how they're going to deal with this climate catastrophe. So we need to be looking at what young people are doing in Puerto Rico, you know, in terms of farming and water. We need to be looking at Cooperation Jack Jackson Rising and the work that Kali and Saki and Brandon, all of them been doing in Jackson. I live 30 minutes away from Soul Fire Farm, the only African American, Latino, people of color farm owned. You know, like I was, me and my husband will always make the jokes yo, if shit gets bad, we're going to hit up Soul Fire and then we're three hours into Canada with our passports, you know. Um, Liberation Farms with Omawali out of Wale, you know, like. I'm seeing incredible spaces where people are, you know, creating, uh, 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 not creating, but are learning how we're going to survive this, where we're at right now with this climate catastrophe. You know, and, and lastly, the more, <laughs> I mean, I've said this to a couple of people, everybody says I'm wrong, but I think Donald Trump's going to win again. You know, I, 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 I think he is. And um, I think he is because every time they talk about him or every indictment that comes, he's raising 25 to $40 million. And it's like, to me, all these networks, even some progressive media outlets are literally responsible for him being the president last time and now again. You know, and also like the, like, People kind of like that. Like the majority of people are like, he's a fighter. He's not going down. He's, and you're like, yeah. And then some that you, y'all don't get it. But then also there's some things that he has said and it's not popular to say, that, but there's some things that he has said that some of us are like, yo, that dude is right. DC is a swamp. Okay. Like we can all admit that, but we know why, <laughs> they're, saying we know why they're saying it. Mm -hmm. you know? And also, like, I've been seeing a lot of people be like, I don't want to deal with identity politics anymore. Identity is dead. Why you always got to talk about that? And I'm like, Trump won on a white political identity. So I don't want to hear that about me calling myself a black Puerto Rican is identity politic. That doesn't mean anything. No, this dude is running on that. A billionaire running on a poor working class white identity. That's why he might win, you know, and then. 
we're, we're in a situation now where I don't think people, no, you know what? I, I think what's happening is the veracity and the speed of everything that's bad that's happening. It's coming to, it's all the time. It's all the time. You know, like that whack-a-mole, like, and you're like, that's what's happening. And people are disorientated. People are scared. People are seeing what just happened in Hawaii, in Ma'u. They're seeing what happened here in the Northeast. They're seeing New York City sink. Like everything we were told about the climate catastrophe, I think people thought it would be a buildup. No, it's been building up. Now we're in a climate chaos. And if we don't intersect that in all the work, then what's the work that we're doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking for the MCs that are talking about, you know, what we're going to do about climate. Well, you know what I'm saying? Go, we can go as most deaths album, right? Well, yeah. 15, 20 years ago where he yeah. talked about water and that mm -hmm. water would be the, the, the gold. And he yeah. was great. We can yeah. see what's been happening and the, also that the climate catastrophe displaces people. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about refugees, we, we now have to say refugees from climate. Mm hmm. Because that's people have to move. People are not going to stay somewhere where they know they're going to die. You know, and precisely uh, and, and Africa, our continent, the, the continent's been, you know, as all climate folks will tell us, is that the majority of the climate polluters are in the United States and Europe. But the majority of those being affected are black, brown people all over the world who are poor. Yeah. I mean, man. You hit the nail. That's what I'm saying. You got bars. Those you got. You've been spitting bars this whole time. That's what I'm saying. This is real I hip hop. Know, I might have. <laughs> this is real bars right here. This is. I mean, we talk about hip hop being, you know, the platform that originally like brought the reality to the forefront. But this is what you're doing right now. You know what I'm saying? You're making it plain, as Malcolm said. You know what I'm saying? Make it plain. And I'm wondering too, like, I, well, we've got about 30 minutes, but I wanted to dig into your journalism a little bit because you brought us stories from the front lines, you know what I'm saying? Um, that we wouldn't have gotten if it wasn't for you, you know what I'm saying? Just going when, you know, it was pretty dangerous. You know what I'm saying? To go over to uh, the island and, you know what I'm saying? Just give us all these, these firsthand accounts. And I think, you know what I'm saying? We, To me, I originally felt the, like this about hip hop. I don't know if hip hop has this role anymore, you know, in this in this world. But I'm, uh, you know, as the fifth element, I wanted you to speak a little bit about, you know, your journalism. And um, and I don't know if that's something you're going to continue to do in that kind of way, you know, like going on the ground or. Yeah, I just want you to talk about that some more. No, definitely. I, I, I will do that the rest of my life, you know, as long as I can. But um, I, I didn't go to school. I didn't go to school, you know, to be a journal journalist. I didn't really understand the power of media, I would say. So probably when I joined the Malcolm X grassroots movement, you know, but um, yes, I, I think my first, my journalism started because um, I have written an article called who is black and then another article that said russell simmons is not hip-hop and both those articles well the who is black article um because at that time i think we just had like web browsers and chat rooms i can't even remember um because that article alone is like 22 years old but i wrote them both in the same year when i wrote the who is black article um I don't know how I got to the Nation of Islam and, and, and the final call offices, but it did. And I had someone say, Minister Farrakhan wants to know if we could run your your article. And I was like, absolutely. I know the power of the Nation of Islam um, and I know the power of the final call, you know? And I was like, yes. And I started getting letters from brothers, particularly who were incarcerated, who, who read it. At the same time, um, Sophia Bakari, who is one of the most radical revolutionary liberation people, was kidnapped by the state, escaped. She was doing a show with Sally O'Brien, um, an Irish woman who's like the epitome of 
all revolutions <laughs> uh, at that time at WBAI 99.5 in New York City. And they had heard me speak and they said, why don't you come and sit in? And they do to this, well, Sophia Baccarat has passed away. They do a show called Where We Live. And the whole show was about uplifting and talking about political prisoners. So I started coming in and started to know how to use a soundboard and all of that, your mic and stuff like that. And then the 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 struggle around Vieques Puerto Rico um, was at its peak, and I had been doing the show, but by that time I was also my Who Is Black article and Russell Simmons is not hip hop article had he kind of blown up. Davy D to me he is the premier hip hop journalist archivist. He ran it in his thing and brought me on his show. Then I'm a we're both within Pacifica Network and the Amsterdam News you know, a very historic black newspaper to this day um, coming out of Harlem, like the United States after probably 67 years of protest, but a deep five years, we're like, we're out. We're leaving Vieques. There's too much protest happening. And I went to Vieques. I went to the island and covered it. And what it was, was at midnight on May 1st, 2002, maybe, or 2000, no, it was after South Africa, so 2002, at midnight in Vieques, you see all the U.S. Navy leaving. At the same time, there's thousands of people, and it was just like euphoric, and 67 years of waiting to get the United States, uh, to get the Navy out of Vieques happened. I mean, I'm walking, and I'm walking next to Lolita Lebron, like the fiercest independista ever woman like killing it she was like 85 and i see all the free pps of uh, the puerto rican political prisoners and i'm covering it and the next day i did a segment on democracy now and then i was like i can do this so the next biggest thing for me after that was then going down to new orleans to cover um the the levee breach um and hurricane katrina and then after that it's been uh Ferguson and Puerto Rico, um, some of the protests in North Carolina. Um, I mean, I was at the RNC in Minnesota when that went down. It, I was playing an activist organizer and also a journalist. But yeah, so, you know, the good thing about not, quote, being considered a journalist in that sense is great. You know, I'm like, I go when I can go. I'll bring people if I can, but I don't have to, I don't beg anybody to you know, give, give me a, a column or something. I'm always going to do the journalism thing. But I, I've had many years now, especially there was a time when Jamila Lumu was the editor at Ebony and every week she'd be like, yo, you need to write about this, write about this, write about that. And she kind of brought me into the more like bigger mainstream world of journalism. Yeah. So yeah, as soon as I can kind of like walk better and stuff, you never know when things are going to pop off, but the, the, the biggest one for me to this day is always going to be Katrina, Ferguson, and then Puerto Rico on the map. And with Puerto Rico on the map, you know, it, at first I wasn't going to go because I was like, man, I just got back. I might not have the money. I can't go by myself. What's the crew and all this? And my dad called me and he said, you going? And I said, I don't really have it. He goes, so you're going to go, right? And we're going to send you some money. And then I, I, my sister was like, just set up a page. And within like days, we had like $40,000. And I took a whole crew with me. And all of them were younger. And all of them were Latino, Latino, Latinas, whatever they were. And we spent 11 days in Puerto Rico covering, you know, every night, all day, all the time, you know, kind of thing. So for me, um, PR on the map was probably my greatest kind of um, journalism, but also collective and bringing these folks. I mean, one of them decided he would live in Puerto Rico, Eli Fantuzzi. He's like, if I if you, I didn't come, I wouldn't have come back to Puerto Rico. And the rest are just doing incredible journalism themselves and incredible work, you know, and I'm so grateful that they rolled with me and that they were all younger and could kind of school me on certain things too. So, yeah. Yeah, I followed that one a lot. Like I was watching it like every day. I feel like you really, you really brought us into. I want to say like a personal reality that we wouldn't have been able to have. You know, it made us feel like we we're right there with you. 
So I appreciate that. You know, I do a lot of activism, organizing, and um, uh, during the hurricane, I did a, um, a kind of, you know, relief, some relief efforts, and I worked yeah. with um, some of the uh, Boricuas here in Detroit to um, identify, you know, people there that they, their families and things to like, you know, um, support. And they had closed down the airspace and we couldn't even um, get things to them like at that time. And um, so, you know, a, a lot of the communications were, you know, like down and things like yeah. that. So you um, actually provided like a lifeline to our community here. So I was able to share your broadcast with, you know, uh, my comrades and things here. So you actually really, you know, help people. Cause when, when, you know, I don't know, like when you don't, when you don't uh, see, uh, when you know the devastation that's happening and you don't see the levels of urgency being placed on it, it can give you a certain sense of like hopelessness. But I think, you know, for you to be able to like describe what's happening in real time and, you know, help people to just really, you know, uh, make that connection. I think, I don't, I, I know, you know, that it's important and I know, you know, it's like, you know, uh, you know, really crucial. I just wanted to share with you just how important and how crucial, you know, what you do is to so many people. So, you know, yeah, it's interesting because um, when we were there and capturing so much footage, we I actually went to see to my uncle who lives in, in Puerto Rico and he used to work for Con Edison for over 40 years in New York. And I said, Theo, like, how long is it gonna take there's for the you know the electricity to come back? They're saying a week. He's like, Oh, a year. I was like, What? And he's like, A year. That everybody will have. But and the thing that people don't know is that there were already rolling blackouts on the island due to the um, basically fiscal control board, much as what they did in Detroit and Flint and other cities, take control away from the people, Puerto Rico, who, um, and, and their elected officials. But, um, you know, also we had gotten a tip from one of my homies out there and we go to where he said, and we were the first ones to report that <clears throat> there were dead bodies in these trucks. Um, like, 10 of them it, it, and right outside of San Juan where they were telling us the, the National Guard was like, oh, it's fruit and meat and everything. And somebody came up to us and was like, no, there's dead bodies there. Plus also like um, the, the um, one of the brothers who came since he, um, he had a drone. So we were able to fly drones, right? Like to see, and you know, we get there and the, what we see is like, in a, such a long line of people literally just waiting for water. And we go up to the National Guard because there's a fence and we're like at the mortuary morgue and we start talk, I start talking to them and I'm like, yo, what's up in there? And one of the younger brothers was like, dead bodies. And I was like, yeah. So we, we were reporting that live. I always was like, I got a signal every time I went live. I'm not, I don't believe in God or Cause stuff like religious stuff like that. But I was like, obviously this is a sign. Cause every time I went on, I could get a signal, but um, I got a call from New York times and some other people were like, how can you verify it? I'm like, cause I'm here, right? I'm here. And like, we need verification. I was like, yeah, that's why I don't you know, F y'all. Like I'm the verification. The people are kind of the verification. And also I think our crew was also instrumental at least in being in line with like they were lying about how many people were dead, you know, because even when we left after that, was it the, the hurricane was September 2017. Um, I, we got there late September. Then I will probably there to October 10th or 11th. Um, you know, I, I was just like, they're lying. There's no way there could only be 210 people dead. That absolutely doesn't even make sense because we were traveling to places where bridges were collapsed and we were being told by Boricos on the island, oh, my abuela died and I'm burying her in the backyard until we can bury her properly. You know what I'm saying? Like people were holding on to their dead body loved ones because where could you go? Ain't no more coming. No hearse is coming. And they were, and I said, this number is not right. I said, they did this in Katrina. 
because Carmen and Katrina, they lied about the deaths and how many, right? And they had to do a whole investigation. So then Harvard, in the best way, spent a year there, their, their school of something, and, and they documented over 4,400 deaths. And that's why we say 4456 is the amount of deaths that happen. And in any natural disaster, it's usually not the disaster that kills people, it's the aftermath and the lack of governmental support. And what support were we gonna get from a president who threw paper towels at us? Nothing. But it's interesting too, that post Maria is when now you're seeing a new rising of particularly young Afro Boricuas, LGBTIQA Boricuas who have are staying on the island. I have many friends who have rematriated back to the island, you know, and the 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 self-determination and independence fervor grew. And why it grew is because for decades, if you were in Puerto Rico and talking about independence, right, people would be scared and they had a right to be because anybody who was an independista was either murdered, assassinated or put in prison. But there was a, uh, people were scared. But after Donald Trump threw that, I, I say that's the moment where the Puerto Rican consciousness was like, we can be free. And um, one of the former young lords, Panama Vicente Alba, who was with us the whole time, he was like, we got to get this out of the mind that we can't be an independent nation and join the rest of the world, you know, um, and we can self-determine our own fate. So you've seen since Maria, the level of self-determining acts that are happening in Puerto Rico every day. And one of them concretely was three years later, kicking and removing Ricardo Rosario from office after him and his people who were horrible anyway, all the leaks of their texts came out about how they were calling like, you know, they didn't care about Louisa, the African descendant community, Camuy, the indigenous descendant community. They were saying crazy things about the Carmen Yulin Cruz, who was the mayor of San Juan. And, um, you know, the people, not only the like it wasn't about voting him out is literally sustained for three weeks and up to two million people in one protest that's what made the governor finally leave so these are the things that you don't know if you're going to pick up because everything's happening so fast but when you cover these kind of things right like you can't always forget the politics of the people on the ground and they're the ones who are our sources when people are like who's your source i'm like the people that's my source I believe everything they're saying. Yeah, you know what you remind me of in all of that? Um, I just joined this Bomba group here in Detroit. My um, my mentor shouts out Ozzy Rivera, who uh, is a elder and uh, organizer here in Detroit. And he was a young Lord and went on the run, but came back to be a, <laughs> an organizer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, shouts out to uh, Ozzy. And so... Um, I noticed like uh, maybe since the Black Lives Matter protests or something, like it's a lot of more young people like doing bomba. But then I think back when uh, I found out about Vieques from you, maybe 20, 20, is it 20 years ago now, right? Yeah, like, I'm tr I think it might be 2003 still. It's yeah. around there. Cause I remember being I in my living room in Brooklyn yeah. and, 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 and you, you know, and, and seeing you speak about it. And then I start, then it started to become visibilized to me. And I feel like I was going places and I was hearing more people say it at like in hip hop events and things like that. And so yeah. I feel like for me, what I've experienced your role in hip hop as like, you know, bringing these ideas to like, I don't want to say make them cool, but I'm going to say like make them cool to talk about or make people feel safe to talk about them. Or I don't know if those are the right words, yeah. but do you know what I mean? Like you, you, you make people feel strong. You know what I'm saying? To be able to like, what do the young people say? Say it with your full chest. Yeah. So like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I feel like for me, that's the role of hip hop in a way, right. Is for us to feel strong in our identities and to say these things, these realities that are happening in uh, these atrocities, you know what I'm saying? To name them. And we say them in full color, right? The language is, you know, powerful. The language is vulgar. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because the actions that happen to us are very vulgar. And I appreciate that you do bring that anger because I feel like was as being in this country, we learn so much to like be so polite. And especially as a woman, like how it's how you say things. Yeah. And 
I just appreciate that your feminism, as I've experienced it, is is bold in a sense that's like, nah, it's it's not happening. This is not going to happen anymore. And this is why. And so, hey, hey, I just want to thank you for that. You know what I'm saying? But also, too, I want to understand. I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I want to understand your courage. And I want to understand how you've been able to be that bold in your courage. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I wasn't raised in a movement household. So I think that's first my connection with a lot of people because so many of my comrades were born into some type of movement and, or self-determining community. Um, I've never been like a quiet person, but definitely, you know, until I went to college, I silenced myself a lot. You know, um, I silenced myself, essentially with my family. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I was just ready to get out. Like I, things were happening and things were, I, I was beginning to remember like my sex, my molestation and, uh, and a lot of things around sexual violence that I faced from other people in my family, not my immediate family, but cousins and stuff like that. Um, and when I went to SUNY Albany, I know that first year I was kind of quiet. You know, it was first I'm like, in this huge environment, you know, and I'm coming at that time where we lived in Westchester. There's a very, very tiny town called Elmsford. It's not even a town. It's considered a village, right? So it was like you knew everybody in the community. Everybody knew you. Everybody went to the basketball game. They knew you. Which, like it was like that Friday night light show. Like it, it, it was utopic. Like, you know, when I left and I and then – Subsequently, SUNY Albany, when I began to travel, I'm like, oh, my God, like I lived in a bubble in a weird way, but I was still dealing with things in, in my home. You know, so I, I know that going to the um, Asuba meeting my second year and then meeting Dr. Gordon, that's where I started to be like, all right. Yeah. You know, and build and build. And my years at SUNY Albany were the most impactful, incredible times. I don't remember anything bad. Um, and that's because it was also the early 90s and you see so many campuses are rich and abundant with black and Latino student organizations like we were doing great programs and all of that kind of stuff. So I think every time now I, I didn't ever think I would be a public speaker in that sense. But when I was a super president, I even built up that skill kind of thing, you know, and I always had in me a, like. I think part of me, because I was abused, um, when I got to college, I was just free, you know, and I, it was okay to make mistakes and it was okay not to know something. It was okay that I'm a crier because, you know, that that's the thing I think most people in my family are like, oh, Rosalie cries. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I was so shamed for being a crier. And now I'm like, they're lucky I cried because I probably would have done some more crazy shit, you know, and put myself in more harm's way because I didn't feel like anything. I, I I didn't feel anything when I was younger and even in high school. I just felt like, well, just go with the flow, do what everybody else is doing, you know. Um, subsequently, I mean, joining the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Once I joined Malcolm X grassroots movement, that was it. You know, I'm with people in, in Brooklyn specifically, like Monifa Bandeli, Lumumba Bandeli, Asha Bandeli, Dream Hampton, Raquel Cepeda, Nayope Acevedo, Jabril Torre. Like, these are the people, uh, you know, uh, Akinyele Omoja, who is uh, Dr. Akinyele Omoja, one of the elders, Chokwe Lumumba, Antar, you know, Raquel. Like, that was, for me, Malcolm X Rasser's movement. And when I moved to Brooklyn, that was it, you know, because I'm seeing so many other courageous people. Like I'm listening to my comrade Lumumba talk about being grown in the East. You know, I, I'm seeing like Asha and Dream and oh, it's just like Jessica Kim Moore, you know, like I'm like I'm reading about these people in college and now I'm l watching them at a Brooklyn event. Oh, my God. You know, and it was just like everybody was courageous, you know, um, 
we had a goal and the, the overarching goal is not only black freedom, but particularly at that time, we were the ones that were doing cop watch the best, you know? So yeah, I, I probably just switched in, in Malcolm X grass's book. And also I had to take time away from my family. I purposely disappeared from them for a minute and I had to do it for myself, you know? Um, now that I look back at it and I talk to my mom and my dad and I think about the courageous things that they had to do and that all they wanted for me and my sister and my brother is to have everything that they didn't have, you know? And I was also first generation college student. Like, isn't that crazy that I was the first generation at this age? My daughter now is the second generation. So yeah. And look, spending 10 years, almost maybe more than 10, spending 10 years on the ground with Dead Prez, <laughs> Rebel Diaz, Immortal Technique, Fred Hampton Jr. Because um, when Fred was released, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., and one of Dead Prez asked me to put a tour together, and we did, it was called Dare to Struggle, Dare to Win, where we were taking Fred Hampton all around the country. you know. And then obviously those of us who took purposeful arrests, demonstrations, and all kind of that stuff. But what Malcolm X Grassroots Movement taught me too was self-defense. Right, like when the shit goes down, how you getting out? What's it gonna be? Who are your people? You know, um, and even having like Kamau, like you know, Kamau Franklin, part of Black, uh, one of the co-founders of Black Power Media. Kamau was our lawyer. You know, so it was also like, damn, we got a lawyer up in the crew. You know, so it was just like, and then Brooklyn was not gentrified. You know, we were doing Black artist concerts. So I, I know my courageousness does come in one way from my mom and the more I know her and the courageous things she's done, but the people and being involved at that time was like, you know, I'm going all out for the rest of my life. And that's how I've tried to live it. Even when it's not popular. Yeah. Well, we're, we're almost at the end. It's like four minutes. One, I want to say for me, like you shared, this is the fifth element of hip hop. So you've been yeah. giving us strictly bars the whole time. It's just bars, bars, bars. So I thank you. I want to invite you back because true sure. talk, when I wrote this proposal to do this show, like you're the archetype. You know what I'm saying? Like you're the blueprint. Like you're who I had in mind. Like what is the way that we could convey to people like all these lessons that we need to know to like survive in this beast? You know what I'm saying? But not just survive, but like, how are we going to win? How are we going to make it through? Like, how are we going to, you know, like tear down all this, you know, oppression? Like how? And for me, it's like you represent that hip hop for me. You know what I'm saying? Like you're. And so I, I just thought about it like, man, this is the type of messaging that we need because there's always these conversations around women in hip hop. Like, you know, she's twerking her lyrics. Da, da, da. Just stuff that I feel like that don't have nothing to do with, like, <laughs> like I don't I care. That's part of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, like we're looking at 50 years of a culture, you know, people say hip hop is dead. I don't, I don't believe that, but I think hip hop needs a restart. You know, I, you know, it's, um, you know, even in all these celebrations is like, y'all can find one woman, like, come on, y'all. And at, at this age, I'm like, I don't even entertain that. I'm like, you know, like, no, I don't want to be the only woman on the panel. No, I'm good. Like, y'all are 52 years old. Get your shit together. You're never going to get together. These men and the misogyny, the patriarchy, the transphobic, like all of that. You know, I, I don't know how to stop that. You know, what I do know is that anybody who's doing this work, after I ran and was like, deeps in my depression a couple years after my daughter was born i got a call from pam africa if people don't know who she is you need to know who the move family is why they've been incarcerated killed and pam africa has been a mentor to me and out of the blue she one day called me and said i know you're sad i can feel it don't ever forget you're consistent and always be consistent with who you are. And that's always in the back of my mind. And then my mentor, Dr. Maita Moreno Vega, who's like, we ain't got time for these feelings. 
they're trying to kill us. What are you going to do about it? You know, like, you know, but um, I do encourage people to take a break because what I'm seeing with my folks, I mean, my own um, health this past year has been horrible and I'm coming out of it, but a lot of my friends, right. And we were always like, we're not going to be like our elders will tell us don't burn out. Don't do this. And then now here we're 50, 51. And we're like heart attacks, brain things, seizures and all this. And it's like the poisonous effect, the white supremacy folks like us, when we wake up every day, we don't wake up like it's just going to be a beautiful sunny day. Yeah, we wake up and we enjoy the sun, knowing that any time this shit could go crazy, you know, go knowing that any time something can happen. That's part of being, I think, part of a revolutionary organization that you kind of always be like, yo, let me look to the left and right to see what's going on. Um, so it's important that we take care of ourselves and don't burn out because the Ferguson movement and, and, and rebellion a lot of warriors were lost, those purposely killed, but those who are still suffering now. And over, you know, and, and going down to cover Ferguson, I, I had to be telling a lot of the young folks, like your energy is good. Just remember, it's like a long haul. You, as Mumia says, the long revolutionary struggle. You know, so I would encourage people be mindful of your health, what you're eating, but also like what you, who you allow around you. Cause it took me up until like a couple years ago, maybe even last year to be like, you're a parasite. You only call me when you want something. I ain't got time for this, you know, like kind of thing, because I was growing up in a place where a girl never said no. And you always said yes. And you always look pretty and you never yelled. You never show your power because maybe you won't get married if that man sees you having too much power. These are the kind of things I was raised up in by people, in my entire family, especially the women, like, don't say a lot. Don't be too smart. You're too much in your head. And I had to root that all out. And once I did it, I mentally feel amazing. Physically, my body still got to catch up, you know? So, yeah. So let's thank you for sharing and being transparent with that. And um, in the description, we have your payment links, like your Venmo, your Cash App, PayPal. Can you um, tell folks why we want them to um, donate to your uh, your your cause because you know we love you and we want you to be around here and we want to help you do all the things that you need to do to thrive. But I wanted you to you know say it from your mouth. Yeah. So thank you, First Piper, for even doing that because I I've had a very rough year. Anybody could look at my Instagram. That's a whole show in itself. So we got to talk about Black women and hysterectomies and reproductive because that's where all my issues stem from. Um, I'm super grateful. I mean, my community has carried me, my husband and my daughter, um, in a time where I was like, couldn't, couldn't walk and wasn't able to work. Now I'm kind of getting up out, out of it. And I'm seeing the need for me to be able to like be sustained in a way where I can create, uh, something that I can pass down. Um, so I'm grateful for everybody and I'm grateful for you to even bring it up because it's, I've been going through this since last October, you know? Um, so I'm always grateful for, for that. Um, and I want to put it towards um, the nonprofit that, that I, I recently created where I want there to be a space for us as black Latino, Latino, Latinx, black Boricos, Dominicanos, that we come together without the branding and the, it's trendy right now to say that, but we come together and not only support each other, but we continue to put out the narratives of those of us who assume and, and know that we're racially black and how we still have those conversations outside of like the binary of black and white in the United States. And I do my work through the hip hop lens, you know? Um, so I, I'm glad that I got it and, and two flies about to do the logo <laughs> on it. And I, and I really want to use this collective, this um, kind of black Latinx collective 
to also be like a clearing site for all that is great around Afro Black Latinas identity in the United States. I don't study it in Cuba, Puerto Rico, any of that. And I think that's the important, the difference I'm doing my work in. You know, I respect all of it was happening in Cuba, uh, Colombia, Puerto Rico, and all of that around African and Blackness. But I'm studying us here in this country. Boricos like me, Dominicans, like my friends who were born and raised here have some connection to our island. But our politic is a Black radical tradition politic. You know, and I see, the, see that there's not a space for that, even though Black, Latinx, or afro Latin is trending. There's not a space for us because a lot of the stuff that's trending actually excludes us. It's now being overtaken by white Latinx that never said they were black or indigenous, but now see the branding, the visibility. So now all of a sudden they're black. I'm like, dude, you ain't black. And I don't mean the white Latinas. I, I, I could talk about some other darker skinned Latina women that are also super anti-black in Hollywood and, you know, and are really blocking the space for there to be something that speaks to us. And with that, I am unapologetic. You know, like y'all keep erasing us. I'm not gonna, you know, talk about why you're doing it. I'm gonna say it here, but then I'm building the alternative or I'm building the solution. You know, I'm not begging for y'all to, you know, acknowledge us anymore. We've done that. Now what do we build? How do we institutionalize it? And how do we pass it down to the next generations? Yeah, and so I really appreciate that you said that. I went to a, a exhibition, it's got to be like 15, 20 years ago in the Bronx. When they first started trying to uh what do they call it now by the uh the it's by the by the two but what is it by the three train? Well, it's a uh, what's the name of that uh the Bronx Museum of Arts? No, no, it, it, this was like an independent thing, but they changed the name of that neighborhood. They were trying to change. It's no, not they like changed so bro, so bro, so bro, yeah, yeah that's, that's what it's so bro. So, yeah. uh, there, so, so some comrades of mine did an exhibition. They made it. They made their own uh, gallery, I guess, but it's they call it a museum, and it's for Black Tino. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, they, the, the, my friend did this uh, exhibition where she kind of like did all the stereotypes, like, you know, it's always supposed to be like sexy, hot, Latina yeah. of a thing. And, um, you know, uh, they we, we did like some video, we did some photography, we did some like, um, I guess like, you know, in-person like art, like, you know, theater. Um, I'm, oh man, I'm so sad, but uh, th their space isn't there anymore, but they were trying to hold space I, that's the three train, right? Oh, I know what space you're talking about, but it's off. It, I I know what space you're talking about. Casa. Yeah. Yes. Casa yes. Bronx. Yeah. yeah. Are they still there? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I think they got pushed out. But they yeah. were really trying to like hold that location specifically for you know folks that identify as Black Tino. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um. So you're right. It's like that is very necessary like to like that specific conversation is probably a super important conversation to continue to have so anytime you want to have that conversation you come right here because i'm trying to have that conversation anytime all the time <laughs> yeah yeah because that's what's up we, we gotta have more conversations about that because yeah. there's so many we are talking about levels Jesus to it Black messiah next one Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. That'll be a whole nother, a whole nother thing. Cause we gotta uh, uh, keep talking about. We gotta keep uh, letting people know that Cointel Pro ain't going nowhere. It's yeah. actually got yeah. stronger. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's actually got stronger. Well, we're at the end. I thank you so much for thank spending you, this I'm much time. Um, I know people know it, but just for the sake of shits and giggles, give us all the places where people can find you. Oh, my website, rosaclemente.net. Um, and then my email is clementehost at Gmail. I answer all my emails. I don't have an assistant or nobody is me. Um, and Instagram is Black Puerto Rican PhD and Facebook is Rosa Clemente. So, yeah. So, um, but I encourage people to go to the website. It has all my archives, all my articles, interviews. And if you want to book me, hit me up. Yes. And, you know, thanks for having this conversation with us here. I love it. Beyond breaking ba barriers on Black yeah. Power Media. We're here every Monday Bye. at 8.
Yeah. I'm so glad you're part of it. And please, if you all haven't subscribed to Black Power Media, please subscribe. I mean, Kalanji uh, just did this great interview with Dream earlier. I mean, it was dope. Yeah, I know. It was, it was dope because it's like, if, if people just need to know who Dream is. And for those of us who know who Dream is, it's like Dream. You know, it was incredible. It was so good. But I'm glad you're part of the Black Power Media and folks just subscribe. And um, yeah, you can see the interview with me and Dr. Ball we did a couple months ago. So I'm glad you're part of the collective. So thank you. And you have a wonderful uh, rest of your week. Thanks. And um, happy Hip Hop 50. Yes. <laughs> and the thing is, we got we can celebrate the whole year until they're 51. <laughs> right. There I'm telling you go. everybody, we just started. Two right? Days. We, oh, yeah. we still got November. We got November. <laughs> right, right. That's still got November. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you take care. Yep. All right. All right. Peace. Peace.